Hi folks, this is Luke Hauser, author of Direct Action, an historical novel. I'll be narrating this history of direct action and nonviolent civil disobedience from the American Revolutionary period up to the present. You can get more information at www.directaction.org. And now, a history of direct action. What is direct action, besides a classic adventure novel? Direct action is any action we take that immediately impacts our world. This could be as simple and mundane as recycling or volunteering for a youth program, or as dramatic as being a nonviolent peacekeeper in Palestine or inner city Oakland. Sometimes we fall into regarding only illegal civil disobedience actions as direct. In fact, any time we undertake to make change ourselves, rather than delegating it to an authority or lobbying the government to solve the problem, we're taking direct action. Direct action has a long and well-documented history. Some famous examples of direct action in this country are the Boston Tea Party and the entire American Revolution, the Underground Railroad, the Women's Suffrage Movement, the Civil Rights Movement, the entire early history of the Labor Movement, the uprisings at Alcatraz and Wounded Knee, the Women's Rights Movement, the Gay Rights Movement, cultural movements such as the Beats and Hippies, Food Not Bombs, Presida Eyes Mural Project, and anyone who has ever posted a flyer on a telephone pole. Why take direct action? I assume that most people watching this show already know that we can't expect the government, corporations, banks, boards of regents, and other institutions to initiate change. It's not a matter of electing better leaders. The problem is the nature of the system, which is based on greed and exploitation. The most we can expect from government is for them to ratify rights that have first been won in the street. This has been true of the rights of unions, women, people of color, gays and lesbians, the list goes on and on. Unless people who care about the world take direct action and make change ourselves, there's no pressure on the government to do anything besides serve the rich and powerful. This is not an argument against government. We need government institutions to back up the hard-won victories of direct action. The civil rights and labor movements achieved miracles in the street, but at some point it was essential to nail down the victories in concrete legislation. This is the pattern of social change. It's won in the streets and ratified in the halls of Congress. Part of the development of direct action in this country has been the increasing emphasis on nonviolence. For earlier movements such as the American Revolution, the abolitionist movement, and union organizing, violence was often a component of their strategies for change. More recent efforts have moved toward a commitment to nonviolence. Sometimes this grows from a spiritual practice, and sometimes it reflects a commitment to principles of love and unity, such as the hippies. But nonviolence can also be adapted to unify diverse communities in mutual trust and respect. In the 1980s anti nuclear movement, all participants were expected not only to take a nonviolence prep, but to make an explicit commitment to the nonviolence guidelines, which forbade not only physical but also verbal attacks on opponents. While some protesters strongly held these as core values, others merely adopted them for a single protest. The guidelines served as a basis of trust and unity so that strangers winding up in the same blockade line or jail cell could count on a certain level of agreement on tactics. We'll return to the 1980s anti-nuke movement, but for a moment let's flash back to the 1970s. The Vietnam debacle wound down by 1975. In the aftermath of the top-down, male-dominated organizing of the 1960s, the 70s saw a breakthrough for women's rights and gay rights in the U.S. and in Europe. Both of these movements emphasized small groups, consensus, non-hierarchy, and a focus on interpersonal relations, issues that became central to the direct action movement of the 1980s. 
A second response to the mass protests of the 1960s was the new focus on decentralized direct actions. Protests were organized by loose networks with no central leadership. Affinity groups made their own action plans within guidelines agreed upon at representative spokes councils. These lessons began to pay dividends as protests against nuclear power in Europe and on both U.S. coasts resulted in hundreds and even thousands of arrests in the later 1970s. Under the impetus of President Reagan's re-escalation of the Cold War, protesters in Europe in the early 1980s turned their focus from nuclear power to nuclear weapons. This was a pivotal shift and a major inspiration for the anti-nuclear movement in the United States. Marches in Amsterdam and in Bonn, Germany each drew hundreds of thousands of people during this period. These European marches were among the largest in the world during the 1970s and 80s. Here, thousands of protesters march at Camiso, Sicily, near a U.S. base. Activists in Germany and England also protested outside U.S. military installations. In these years, the peak of the Second Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, the U.S. had over 100,000 troops stationed in Europe, along with thousands of nuclear warheads. German protesters staged die-ins outside U.S. bases, often blocking movements of U.S. troop convoys and nuclear weapons. The influence of colorful actions like this was direct. Activists from the U.S. traveled to Germany and England in these years and took part in such actions, bringing lessons back home. Not all lessons were transferable. Police tactics in Germany were different. Where U.S. authorities generally arrested protesters with varying amounts of force, German authorities often used water cannons. These shots give some sense of the European backdrop to what would soon unfold in California. That's the end of part one of A History of Direct Action. Come back for part two where we'll take a look at the early 1980s direct action movement in California, a period of thousands of arrests and a major leap forward in direct action tactics. Also, visit www.directaction.org where you can download the complete copy of Direct Action, an historical novel by Luke Hauser. That's me. Been great being with you folks. Hope to see you for part two.